Welcome to the SRS Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron J. Babiar, and I'm the Training Director of Support Raising Solutions. Whether you're a new ministry worker or a veteran looking to increase your competence and confidence, Support Raising Solutions seeks to bless you in your quest to be a spiritually healthy, vision-driven, fully funded Great Commission worker. My guest today is Mark Schatzman. Mark is a, a friend of mine and actually a, a pastor of mine, and I had the opportunity recently to sit underneath his teaching, and he, he it was part of a team teaching through Ecclesiastes, and a uh, part of, I know already some listeners are going, wait, Ecclesiastes, yes, Ecclesiastes, uh, but that's that's actually, that really spurred something in my heart and mind when he used the term necessary evil, and so often, uh, so many people that I've come across in, in raising support have really had that posture and have really been wondering about, is support raising just a necessary evil? And so that's what we want to dig into today and discuss. And so I'm going to go ahead, before we even get started and and, and talking with Mark, I'm going to go ahead and say, if you already know of people that have that posture towards raising support, I'm going to go ahead and encourage you, I and mean, you can wait till the end of the podcast if you want to, but share this with them because Mark has the heart of a teacher and uh, also bring some scripture into this that I think could be really challenging and encouraging as people consider uh, their posture towards the opportunity of raising support. So that's enough of an intro. Mark, welcome, my friend. I'm glad you're here today. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate even the invitation. Well, first of all, before we dig into the topic, tell us a little bit about you and your family and your, your history and ministry, because I know this isn't your uh, your first day out of Bible college. Yeah. Uh, it's the second. <laughs> it's the second. Uh, actually, didn't start in pastoral ministry. So 30 years ago, started on staff with Crew. So back okay. then, we called it Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, my wife, Lisa, and I were spiritually formed in many ways through the disciple-making movement on a campus and mm-hmm. thought we would be heading there and heading overseas uh, behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, the Iron Curtain fell down in, right. the, in the middle of our support raising process. Okay. And so, and we had our first child. And so crew had us stay stateside for a couple of years. And uh, during that, we we're actually part of helping plan a church in our community and doing this little thing that started feeling bivocational. And I kind of through the side door moved towards the pastorate. And that was about 22 years ago. So we did eight years on staff with crew okay. and then 22 on the pastorate. Okay, great, great. And then uh, now, of course, you and your wife live in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, h- how many kids? How many grandkids? Cause I know God has blessed you over the years. Yeah, we have five. We have five children and five grandkids. Okay. So uh, the first four are out of the house, adults on their own, 25 to 31. And then we had a bonus come late in life, and he is 12 years old at home. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you and I have some different but similar roots because I, of course, was involved with a church planting situation. And uh, years ago, I was on staff at the same church you're on staff at now. And so uh, what's been kind of fun is I've gotten to know you, not necessarily accidentally, but you and I run in a lot of the same circles. And yet you and I have not often ran in the same circle. (laughs) With the exception of we usually see each other uh, at, at worship service. Because you like to sit up front. I do like to sit up front. When I sit in back, I, everybody distracts me. Yeah, I, I get that. <laughs> so I'm a little bit too on the edge of ADD. So <laughs> anyway, well, Mark, um, yeah, you said something recently, and, and I already mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you said the terms necessary evil uh, as, as a part of your uh, talk regarding Ecclesiastes. And I know you weren't just talking about raising support, but in my world, mm-hmm. that's a term that is so loaded. And I don't want to say like I jumped out of my seat, but I think I had a physical reaction <laughs> when you said those words. And I was like, oh, I got to I got to have a conversation with Mark about this and I need to record it because you weren't just talking about support raising. You were talking about work in general. And so I'm going to first just kick it to you and ask you to give us some more context and biblical context about what it is you were referring to. And I realize I'm kind of asking you to put your entire sermon and summarize that in a couple of minutes, but you know, go for it. Do the best you can. (laughs) Aaron, you know, I'm a wordy man, so that's hard, (laughs) but I think the, the gift that the Lord gave, uh, more than a couple years ago. Let's just pick it up at about 15 to 18 years ago. So I had left staff with crew, was working as a pastor, had had also worked in a in a business environment, an insurance environment before that. And I really began to deal with men and women who were in the workaday world and they struggled with this 
whole concept of what is ministry and what is secular work. And okay. I really wrestled with it because the Bible doesn't present those categories. And if God doesn't present those categories, maybe those are false categories we've created. Hmm. And so what came out of that was what I'll call a, a theology of work. And the theology of work in the simplest forms has two guardrails that keeps us from falling off the ledge. Um, one guardrail in both Ecclesiastes and in Genesis happens in Genesis 2 before the fall. And that is work is this God-given, glorious, actually worshipful assignment. Mm. And in fact, Ecclesiastes even calls it a reward. He says, mm. this is your reward, your gift from God, that you have this work to do with your hands. Right. And uh, so on one hand, you have work as worship. That's one guardrail. But then the other guardrail comes to us from Genesis 3, which is after the fall. And there all of a sudden we tell, see that God says your work will never work. The mm -hmm. ground's going to push back. Your best day is you'll grow an apple and you will have a bloody hand because of the thorns and the thistles. That's yeah. your best day at work ever. Yeah. You're going to lose. <laughs> yeah, your worst day is the apple doesn't come up from the ground and you have a bloody day, a yeah. bloody hands. Yeah. Ecclesiastes calls it toilsome toil. Yeah. And that's where I think we started using that phrase necessary evil. And you see that in our culture. People are dying to get out of work. Yeah. I mean, they want to retire early. That's the dream. They want to vacation more. And I'm not saying that we should work all the time. That's not work-life balance. Um, but it definitely to tells you that we have a theology of work, that work is a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. And then when you kick it over to ministry, there are things in our jobs that we have put in the category of necessary evil and just stopped seeing them as an opportunity that God says, no, I, I, this can be your worship. Yeah. Support raising for missionaries or for those really in, in a field that... Uh, the organization doesn't directly provide their salary. Support raising can be that. And if I was to challenge the listeners right here as we're processing through this, my goal, and I don't really get to have a goal for everybody's life, but if I had one, would be to, to, to move you a notch. Move you a notch in your, in your thinking and in your even how you're seeing what God has blessed you with and raising support. It seems like most people, Mark, that I come across with when they're thinking and considering or doing raising support, they fall in the necessary evil category sure. or the, uh, it's okay, I guess. You know that. Well, that's progress, so I'd right. love it if people <laughs> moved even that far to, uh, okay, I, I believe I, I believe this is good. Um, I, I can do it to, I mean, I love it. Mm. I love it. And I believe I have gone through all four of those phases. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And to this day, I, I will be honest, I love it. I don't like phone calls. Mm -hmm. I don't like phone calls. But when I have an opportunity and I need to raise some more support or I get to I get to step into that, I actually do love it now. Mm -hmm. But part of that is it's just the posture of what I get to do and inviting people into partnership and being a part of the kingdom. That's exciting to me. Um, but early on I saw it more as, Oh, I, I got to ask somebody for money. I, yeah. you know, my daddy told me no, never ask anybody for nothing, you yeah. know, <laughs> or yeah. not that my dad actually said that, but you know what I mean? So anyway, so to the listeners, I just hope that, um, in our conversation today, you're, you're being challenged to really, Consider wh where is your heart really? Is it just a necessary evil or is it just okay, I guess? Or do you actually, maybe you can start to believe this is a good thing. Or if you already think it's a good thing, maybe yeah. you can start moving into, you know what, I actually love this. Yeah. So a little and, aside there, Mark. Yeah, and Aaron, even both at the same time. Right. So since yeah. we live with both Genesis 2 and 3 in our rear view mirror, or Genesis 2 before the fall, work was given. So in other words, paradise would not be paradise if it didn't include daily work. Mm -hmm. But then after the fall, we're promised that work is cursed. So if work is worship, Genesis 2, and Genesis 3, our work will never really totally work. That means we're all going to battle mm -hmm. parts that we love and parts that we hate at the same time. And yeah. I think we're kidding ourselves when we think that ministry should just be the stuff we love. Yeah, it's all kumbaya, my Lord, right? I know, and uh, <laughs> ministry is going to come with a lot of Genesis 3, just my work's not working. You know, mm -hmm. I've made 150 uh, support phone calls. I've gotten nothing but voicemails. Mm. No one's returning my emails. I uh, can't get face-to-face -face with anybody. And does this even matter? Yeah. Well, that's Genesis 3, God promising that the ground will push back and not bear fruit at times. Mm -hmm. But then he turns right back around and says, 
be faithful with this. And as you faithfully work the ground, you're actually worshiping me. Yeah. And so there's something beautiful and fruitful about it at the same time. So what was it? Cause you raised and lived off support for eight or nine years, you and Lisa. Um, and I realized it sounds like some of your understanding, uh, or better understanding of this happened during that time. And also some after, but tell us a little bit about the, an aha moment for you. Personalize this with a bit of a narrative, if you would. Okay. Uh, didn't come from support raising. Okay. But it did come as I was in a position where our ministry was growing and we were recruiting other staff. Okay. And uh, to be honest, the thing God blessed the most was mid-career staff. So they weren't as, as young as Lisa and I were when we first came on. They were people coming on in their 30s and 40s with full families. Okay. And, uh, and what I noticed is, for example, let's say we had an operations thing. We just needed somebody to ground the, the, the headquarters of our, our mission uh, better. I remember we ran across a guy who worked as an accountant at Ryder Trucks okay. was at their headquarters. And he was good at his job. Um, and we were dying for a financial operator. And we began to recruit him. And he said, well, this is good. I've always wanted to be in ministry. And I've never liked my work. And I think if I could do it for a mission, then I would love it. Hmm. Well, he came on our staff, raised his support, came on our staff, did so for about four or five years. And a few years into it, I remember him looking at me saying, I still hate my job. Oh. And I said, I bet it's because the spreadsheets never changed, did they? I mean, spreadsheets were spreadsheets at Ryder and they were spreadsheets at Crew. Sure. And what happened was he thought that if he could trade and go to a nonprofit mission, then suddenly he would love this kind of work. Hmm. And uh, I started realizing that I was part of the problem here. And I kind of recruited him over with a really bad theology of work. Okay. Which was you were in secular work. And now if you come to sacred work, you're going to just love the same work you used to hate. Never going to have another hard day in your life because yeah. you're in ministry. Yeah. And the truth <laughs> was, through a process, he was wired. He really wasn't, shouldn't. He's a smart guy, but he never should have been an accountant. He ended up moving and heading up HR for us. He had incredible people sets. Hmm. He had problem solving skills in a relational way that was never getting out. So the things that frustrated him mm -hmm. in his previous career with Ryder were frustrating him with ministry because he just, he had work related issues that were kind of deeper at the theological level. Yeah. Now then you extrapolate that out to support raising where I don't know too many of us that go into missions that just love the financial fundraising. Yeah. There yeah. are some. They're few and far in between, yeah. though. So, And I know, and by the way, I'm glad there are some that love it. Yeah. But most of us um, have either learned to like it at best, and quite often, many of us who did it for a long time, learned to endure it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I started finding myself going, Lord, as I sit down to make these phone calls, so for me it was Monday nights, kids were in bed, it was calling further west, and I would just want to do anything but make a phone call, mm -hmm. uh, reorganize my database, mm -hmm. uh, write birthday cards, <laughs> uh, anything, but pick up the 47 pound phone. Trash can basketball is a big, oh, big, big on my big plate. Like, okay. <laughs> anything. And, uh, I just was dying over it. And I remember this sense of Lord just going, Hey, honor me with your work. Mm -hmm. Mark, this is part of your work. Mm -hmm. This is part of it. I know everybody wishes they could wish their bad parts of, of work away. Mm -hmm. Honor me with your work. Yeah. I actually believe this is a, this is an act of worship to me that you're just going to be faithful with the, the plot of ground I gave you. Yeah. And I really started, it started, fran I know that sounds like semantics, but it, it was more than that. It was a heart check that I would sit down for those two hours and go, all right, Lord, this is my two hour plot of ground. I yeah. want to be a faithful farmer today rather than just dreaming it away and hoping crops magically appear. Yeah. And I started almost getting pleasure in pleasing God by just doing the task faithfully. That's awesome. I love that. I love that. A uh, and more inglorious way of saying that is for the Lord, suck it up, buttercup, right? Absolutely. <laughs> it and doesn't it doesn't mean that it's always going to be bad. Yeah. But there are times where it's it's just really hard, and you've yeah, you're we, wondering why is yeah. this not working? But it won't always be that way. It won't. And then the Lord sometimes mercifully gives you these incredibly encouraging calls or these surprise just blessings and gifts where. Mm -hmm. We've all had the time where we've encountered a supporter who has been praying for us in crazy ways or others that we never thought had ability to give who would give yeah. sacrificially and generously the times that humble you and you just, yeah. you realize you're kind of in the middle of a God thing. Yeah, you realize God's at work in ways that you couldn't even right. work at. In fact, Mark, I'll share one with you right now. Uh, recently, uh, due to 
medical bills and stuff like that. Uh, I, I need to raise a little bit more support just to kind of cover the costs of everything. And uh, in, in doing so, I, I spoke with a, a person who's already on my support team. And, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't the right timing. It wasn't like a formal invitation. He was asking how things were going and things like that. And I said, actually, um, now is not the time, but I'm going to give you a call later. I, I would like to sit down with you and we have more than three minutes and get a cup of coffee and just kind of update you uh, on some stuff. And I do need to raise some more support. And I even mentioned a number and, uh, I'd like more, the, more the larger number. It wasn't an ask. I intended mm-hmm. to do the work. Like I really was going to call him and like more formally sit down and thank him for his current gift and invite him to potentially give a little bit more because God is just turning over a lot of fruit in our ministry. So I think he'd be very inspired if he had more of an update. And, and anyway, all that being said, we didn't have that meeting ever hmm. because he called me an hour later on his own volition. And he just said, Hey, um, we can still talk. And I did get him some more information. He says, we can still talk, but God just did something in my heart. And I realized that my family right now, we've been going through a, a real serious time and, um, we need to get alcohol out of our house. And I looked at my budget after you and I talked and we spend about $150 a month in alcohol mm-hmm. that needs to stop right now. And I'm going to go ahead and just start giving that in your direction. So, bump up my current monthly gift by $150. That was awesome. Yeah, you can't make that stuff up. And here's what I'd say, Aaron. If you had not been in the kind of work that required support raising, so right now I'm not, Mm -hmm. um, although we do a lot of funding of different things and participate in fundraising, Sure. I don't have to directly raise support for my paycheck. But if you had not been in a position where you had to do that, Mm -hmm. you would not have had a front row seat to what God was doing. Yeah. And so in some ways... Is support raising a burden? Well, yeah, it is a pressure on y'all. Sure. But is it a blessing? Yes. Yeah. And I think that good theology of work says, see the burden, see the blessing at the same time. And don't don't go either or. Mm-hmm. See a both and. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, keep, that keeps us moving forward with some hope. Yeah. Yeah. If you're enjoying these podcasts and they're hitting on topics that you love, consider following Support Raising Solutions on social media for everyday biblical and practical support raising advice as you're in the process of raising your support. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash support raising solutions and on Twitter at at support raising. Now, the Apostle Paul definitely is somebody who raised and lived off support. And uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of people out there that get confused with the tent making and that's yeah. not the that's not the point of this particular podcast. We have some great information we yeah. talk about in the boot camp and in the Bible study and probably on another one of the podcasts if you're listening and you're wanting to understand uh, Paul's uh, tent making a little bit better. But Paul raised and lived off support and really um, he had a good perspective with it. So I know you had mentioned Philippians 4 to me uh, at one point before we even got recording. Go ahead and dig into that if you would. Yeah, it, I think two things. First of all, Paul saw the reality that support raising was a burden. He never saw it as a necessary evil, never. But he did know that it created some pressure. And so mm-hmm. in Philippians 4.14, he says, it was kind of you that you shared my trouble. Mm. When you think, well, Paul was always in trouble. So what kind of trouble <laughs> did they share? Well, the context of this, he says, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership we, with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. Mm. So the trouble that he was bearing at this point was just a financial need. Mm-hmm. And they chose, maybe the word better word than trouble is burden, but mm-hmm. they chose to shoulder the Philippians shouldered the burden with them. And, uh, and then Paul goes on to say, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. So all of a sudden, Paul says, yes, on the one hand, support raising is a burden. Mm-hmm. But it's also a partnership mm-hmm. in the gospel. And so for your friend who made that conversation about increasing his gift because of some things the Lord was doing in his life and mm-hmm. convicting things the Spirit was doing, that was a partnership in the gospel. Yeah. In fact, even the, you could see the fruit, the fruit obviously in the Babiar household, but the fruit obviously in his household at mm-hmm. the same time. Yeah. And, uh, and Paul calls it, nobody shared in the matter of giving and receiving and receiving. Mm-hmm. So the supporter receives and the supported 
receives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're both and, receiving. Uh, and there's a credit or a fruit going back and forth to both spiritual bank accounts. Yeah. And uh, only God could put that together. Oh, for sure. Um, in fact, I challenge the, the listeners, if you haven't looked at Philippians lately, the whole book, not just chapter 4, but even back in the early verses in, in, in the beginning where Paul very specifically thanks for the partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. I realize the book to the Church of Philippi is, is more than a support raising later, but, <laughs> but look through that lens and it's all over. In there, there is a partnership. They're doing life, even though Paul has a very specific gospel-oriented vocational work Mm -hmm. that is different from the church at Philippi. Mm -hmm. He has a different focus to how he spends the bulk of his time. There's a partnership there. There is a partner. They're helping him plant other churches. They're they're partnering with Paul in the work that he's doing. Yeah, and you know the things that God will surprise us with when those partners create. You know my. Again, this was a long time ago that we raised support, and it was even before dial-up ALL. Okay, so a lot of our stuff were more, (laughs) more sending true prayer letters, you know, uh, and and hard copy back and forth. But in the initial support raising process, um, we were doing what most people have to do: is you're making new friends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so much is referral based, and uh, I got a wrong phone number. Oh. Um, I was given a man's name, and he happened to have a common name, common first and last name. And the guy said, don't worry, he lives on the northwest part of town. You'll probably find him in the book. Okay. We had phone books. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, he said, call him up, tell him I told you, because he loves this kind of ministry. Okay. So I call him up, and the guy goes, who, who did you say referred? And I said, well, it's this man. And he said, I've never heard of him in my life. Oh, no. But the weirdest thing is my wife and I do love that kind of work. Huh. Well, the truth is, his name was so common, I had dialed the wrong number. Oh, wow. And uh, he said, so we're going to have you over for dinner. And he said, I'd love to meet with you, but you, I'd like to meet your wife, too, and we want to have you at our kitchen table because we want our kids to meet you, too. Wow. Because any missionary we support, the whole family's in. Yeah. The kids even give portions out of their allowance. Awesome. And All uh, because of a, a perceived human thing is just the wrong, wrong number, order. right? <laughs> and he, he was our, for the entire eight years, nine years, the smallest monthly supporter we had. Their family came on at 15 a month. Mm-hmm. And the entire family, every month, would exchange postcards and letters back and forth, writing out their prayers for us. Wow. I mean, for the hands of a small child to theirs. And uh, they required that we send bullet points of prayer requests. They taped it to their fridge. They prayed. Yeah. Uh, this went on. I mean, I, I cannot overstate how many correspondence of prayer back and forth. Wow. Well, even two years ago, so I've been off staff 20 something years. Yeah. Now, um, and, uh, 22 at least. Um, and we've made several geographical moves. I get a random letter at the church office. He had looked me up online and said, craziest thing happened, you know, before the alarm, uh, went off this morning. Your, your name was on my mind and I just hunched that it might be the Lord prompting me. You're still partners in the gospel. And he writes this prayer out. He could not have known that the things he was writing out was something we were struggling with one of our adult kids. Wow. And he was praying over the very thing that Lisa and I had been praying for. Well, that came off of our follow, our smallest financial partner, yeah. and yet one of our biggest partners oh, man. in the gospel. Yeah. Uh, That's an incredible and, partnership. Uh, all starting from a wrong number. Well, you can't make that stuff up. No. If crew had put me on salary, I wouldn't have caught that God story. No. No, you wouldn't have. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And so... Um, I think that's a I think that's a pretty good place for us to just kind of wrap up this episode of the SRS podcast. And so, uh, again, to the the listener, I, I just challenge you: if your perspective is is oh, this is just a necessary evil, you're, you're missing out. You're you're missing out, and that's not that's not uh, an attack or anything else. That's more of a an encouragement for you to seek the Lord on this. Check your heart on this. Look at the scripture. Don't don't just take my word for it or Mark's word for it. Look up some of these scriptures we mentioned because at the end of the day, uh, if you're listening to this, the odds are pretty high that God has called you to be a part of a great commission-focused ministry that's way bigger than you. It's way bigger than, 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 than any of us. But it's an honor and it's a pleasure to do work in his name for his kingdom. And yes, some of that toilsome toil, some of that work, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be simple, but it's not evil. 
it, mm-hmm. it's not evil because it's for the Lord. So, Mark, uh, in any last words of encouragement or exhortation you'd like to give our listeners before we close up today? No, I'm grateful for what you do to bring this kind of equipping because these, let's be honest, Aaron, some of the equipping we need is in our vision. Mm-hmm. And hopefully this raises vision up for our gospel workers and our partners in the field and even those preparing to launch because uh, when the support raising gets hard, you can hear all sorts of things that say, is this worth it? Mm-hmm. And should I just get a, a job that'll make it easier? Well, all work is toils and toil, but yeah. at the same time, it is also God's reward and assignment. Amen. And so uh, just to stay faithful and encouraged. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me today. It's been a, a pleasure and an honor to have you come to my, my studio office today and sit down with me. Hey, thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode. We would love to hear your ideas for future content. Please visit supportraisingsolutions.org slash feedback to share your thoughts and questions. Also, wherever you download your podcast from, be sure to subscribe for future episodes and come back each week to gain more insight into the process of building and maintaining your personal support team.